Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for the organizers, to Daniela and Gabriela, for inviting me. It's a great, uh, great honor to be here with Louis. Uh, actually, you may be surprised, but I met with Louis you in the army. I mean, I was in the army officially. <coughs> Uh, to replace my military service, I was a postdoc at the uh, Kurant Institute. Good <laughs> 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 solution, yeah. very good solution. What did you expect? <laughs> he had to salute as he entered. Yes, and so... <laughs> <laughs> Louis asked me all sorts of questions whether I would come at 6 o'clock in the morning to raise the flag. And... Uh, <clears throat> well, what struck I mean, many things struck me at the time. Uh, one thing was uh, the hospitality of Louis. I spent many Thanksgiving at his home. Uh, the other one was, of course, Kurant's very special atmosphere, especially uh, when you came from uh, France. At the time, it was quite tough, I would say. So if uh, you were attending a seminar and uh, you pretend not to understand immediately something, everybody would sort of frown at you because they pretended to understand much faster. And uh, <coughs> then you get at Courant and you have the seminar and uh, all people, uh, Louis would ask questions, very <coughs> sort of natural questions, the question you didn't dare to ask, and Peter Lacks also would ask the question you didn't dare to ask, and then everybody felt extremely comfortable and it was a great change. And so I understood that there are sort of two, actually later I asked one of the <coughs> professor who was in France, why they were so tough at this, and they told me, well, they were tough times, we had to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two philosophies, and that's what I understood at the time, well, people who think that life is miserable, let's make it even more miserable, and people who think, like, do it, that life makes it sometimes be tough, but let's enjoy it as much as we can. And, uh, well, of course, there's also, there was the lounge and the postdoc, and I remember that Louis would ask the postdoc, what did you do the weekend? So some uh, naive postdoc thought, well, I'm going to impress Rui and say I've been working all weekend. And then he would say, well, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> Don't you know that there are movie theaters and museums? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> there are no <laughs> And so that's something I learned. And then when I, I had to interview students, the first thing I asked them was, do you go to movies? Do you go to theaters? Do you go to concerts? And, uh, okay. <clears throat> So it was a uh, great, uh, great honor to be, to be here. I'm very happy. Uh, so where is the, which one is the right one? Sorry. Is, this one? is this one? Ah, okay. So uh, <coughs> there will be essentially no, no proof. I will try to just motivate what symplectic homogenization is. So let me start with the, how I came upon this problem. Actually, it was for teaching a course in dynamical system, and I read some uh, popularization physics uh, uh, paper that was, uh, well, at the time it was not, it was in Paris, it was not in the lounge, but somehow like in the lounge. And so this is the, this, this is a physical phenomenon. Uh, so the first one, uh, ah, yeah. So the first one, so you have a string here, and you fix the endpoints, and then you apply some vibrating force here, and the, which are then by f cos omega t. And when what you what you see, most of the time you don't see anything. You have very small vibrations of the of the string, but there are certain resonance frequencies, so which I denote by omega j, where you have well, if the system was completely linear, you would have infinite uh, oscillation, and uh, because it's non-linear, you have finite oscillation, but quite large oscillation. So that's that was known uh, a few thousand years ago, let's say. And then you can do something which doesn't seem to add much. Uh, you take a bead and you just stick it somewhere on the, on the string. Let's say the mass of the bead should not be too large compared to the, to the string. And see what happens. And you see exactly the same thing. For most frequencies, nothing happens. And then you have certain frequencies for which you have resonance, except that these frequencies now depend on the point where you put where you stick your, your beat. Okay. But so far, there's nothing very, uh, very new in this phenomenon. And then these three people here were physicists in 
Paris, they discover the following thing, is that if the speed is free to slide on the string, then the following thing happens, it will slide up, up to a certain position. So impose any frequency here, okay, f cos omega t, this will slide to a certain position, and this position solves the equation omega is omega j of psi infinity, where psi infinity is somehow the final position of the beam. Okay. So this phenomenon here is very different from this one here. Nothing happened for most values of omega, except a discrete set. And here, something happens for all values of omega. Okay. Uh, well, this is not exact totally true because sometimes you cannot solve the equation, but at least for open sets of omega, you have uh, resonance. And so this phenomenon was called self-adaptative resonance, and the reason why people studied that is the following, is that they were trying to explain the, the, the way the eardrum function. So if you compare the difference between listening to the radio and uh, going to a concert, well, there are two differences. <coughs> When you listen to the radio, you have the radio is a is, is a physical system that has some resonance frequency. And so, if you listen to a certain uh, channel, let's say a balloon or whatever, uh, what you have to do is that to put your radio in resonance with the incoming fre frequency of your channel, radio Uno, for example, and uh, uh, at that at that point you will be able to listen to the radio. Okay. Now, when you go to the concert, what you have is that you have incoming notes from the different instruments. And you're not, you don't have here a knob to, that you're turning in your, in your eardrum that will tell you, well, if uh, this is a C, then I have to, I'm turning my eardrum so that it's in resonance with C and so on. So the phenomenon has to be different. And the idea was the, that this could model uh, the eardrum because it's a system that is basically always at resonance whatever the frequency, provided you have this moving part. So, as far as I understand, I mean, this was some years ago, it's not completely clear what plays the role of this moving part on the eardrum. Apparently, there are some hair on the eardrum that could play this role, but it's not, it's not completely clear. But anyway, uh, if you look at the, at the, at the Lagrangian range, so somehow forget about the, the precise value here. You have some some energy which depends on two variables. One is psi, the position of the beam, and the other is u, the position of the string. And in fact, you don't really care about the position, the actual position of the string. What you actually care about is whether the system is at resonance, so whether you have large or small energy, and what the position of the beam is. These are the two real things we're interested in. So what's, what happens is that here you have a sort of effective potential in psi, depending on u, and what you can actually prove is that uh, you're going to, psi is going to move with this equation, so psi second plus gradient W psi is equal to zero, and it will go to a maximum of W. So it, in fact, it doesn't go to the maximum of W because it's conservative, but if you can just add some minimal friction, it will go to, I mean, it's like if you have a potential well, uh, if you have a real Hamiltonian system, it, does, it stays on an energy level, but as soon as you add some minimal friction, it will go down at the bottom of the web. So this is exactly what should happen here. And well, sort of forget about this if you try to make a finite dimensional reduction. What you see is that you have a Hamiltonian which depends on psi and u, the two variables, and then the dual one variable, t psi and t u. And what happens is that one variable is scaled by one over epsilon, and this scaling just tells you the following, that the movement of the bead here is much slower than the oscillation than the frequency. So this epsilon is just a parameter that comes in. If you write the equation, you will have the tension and the length and so on of the string. But what actually uh, comes, in, comes out in the end is that the movement of the, of the, the horizontal movement, sorry, of the bead here is much slower than the vertical oscillation of the So that's one problem. And then I thought while I was teaching the dynamic uh, system course, and I thought that's a very good example of something uh, but very quickly I realized that it's just possible to, to do that in a course and maybe uh, I wasn't sure it was possible to do that. So this is one example. Another example is uh, of symplectic homogenization is the following. You look at the geodesics for homogenized metrics. So this is quite old. Uh, in, 
this form certainly due to a champion with that, so in 84, but probably some other form maybe to Federer. So you just take a metric on Tn, so think of it as a metric on Rn, which is periodic. And then just renormalize the metric by multiplying by k. So I like to represent it this way. So I like to think as some, so here you have the units, uh, the fundamental domain. And let's say that you have a, the blue region, it's very easy to move, so the metric is small. And the yellow region is the region where it's very hard, it's like a mountain. Just to give you an example of a metric and, and see what can happen. And then what you do is to re you replace what you homogenize, so you see from further and further away. And so you replace this metric here by this one here, and then by this one here, and so on. Don't worry, there are not so many slides like this. Uh, and so you can look at several things. You can look at this, so, sorry, at the, at the sequence of function gk. But it's clear that they're not going to converge to IC like you, I mean, in, in, a reasonable, in a reasonable way. You can look at the distance, which corresponds to the metric. So the distance, well, we tell you if you have, you take a point here, for example, let's say this here, and the point at the top corner, and you try, the, you try to travel from one to the other by the shortest path. And the shortest path will probably try to somehow avoid the mountain, but not completely, and so go something like that. And then you do the same thing, take this point here, take this point here, and then try to travel, and you're going to, to somehow go like this, and from, from one to the other. So what, what you can prove is that actually this metric dk, so the distance dk associated to the metric, converges to some metric d bar, distance, to some distance d bar, sorry, the distance d bar is associated to uh, fixed the metric g bar. So this also tells you why uh, you shouldn't expect convergence of the gk or something like that, because the gk are quadratic forms and they converge to something which is a fixed the metric and usually not remapping. So there's no way you can have this kind of convergence. Then you can look at what happens for the geodesic flow. When the geodesic flow means you're taking the point and the vector and sort of see what happens as you follow on the geodesic this. And well, when you can sort of guess already from the picture is that the geodesic flow is not going to converge to anything because you see if you go from here to here what you're going to do is going to, do, go, to, to go in this direction then so then turn right and then turn left and then turn right somehow and if you if you go here you're going to do the same but more many more times so first uh, you, you go up and then right and then up and then right and, then, and so on and so this, the speed, the velocity vector is going to oscillate very strongly, and so you're not going to converge uh, to anything reasonable. And uh, once you have that, you say, okay, the flow does not converge. Uh, so what converges is the distance. And then you can say, well, there are other quantities I'm interested in for a metric of the torus, for example, what's the length of the shortest geodesic? You can ask, that's the length of the shortest. Uh, geodesic in a given homotopy class conversion. And that's actually very easy to prove that this is the case because a geodesic, a geodesic here on the on the torus, for example, in this homotopy class, so going from here to here, means you're looking at curves which go from here to here and try to minimize. So you, you just look at all curves which start from one point here and end up at the same point here on the other side and try to minimize the length. And you see that it's, if the distance converges, so this is just the distance between two points here, and you're making uh, a minimization over a compact region. So you're going to have convergence of this, uh, you're going to have the convergence of the shortest uh, geodesic in the homotopy class. To what? Well, to the shortest geodesic for the, for the distance d bar or for the fixed metric g bar in the same homotopy class. That's, that's why. That's, that's very easy to prove. What's not so, e not so easy to prove, and maybe I will explain that if I have time in the end, uh, is now if you look at what's called the second shortest geodesic. So what's the second shortest geodesic? Well, this is the uh, old idea of Burke of, of, uh, of Minmax. Uh, and it's the following. So take the shortest one. Okay, so if you have a two torus, you take the shortest one. And then you go around the torus, take a family of curves which goes around the torus, comes back to the original one, and look at the length in the family. 
And if you look at the, the, the shortest, uh, I mean, if you look at the family such that the longest curve in the family is as short as possible, you're going to get the length of what I like to call the second shortest effect. So it's the one obtained by the max. And you could say the same, ask the same question. Uh, if, you're, if you have this sequence, sorry, if you have this sequence here, dk of distance, so the sequence of metric, looking given homotopy class the second shortest geodesic, is it going to converge to the second shortest geodesic for d bar? And by the way, d bar is a flat metric, it's fixed, but it's flat, so it does not depend on the point by, by homogeneity. So uh, in this case, the length of the second shortest and the length of the shortest one is the same because you can make this one parameter family just to be made of translated of the same curve, and because the metric is uh, homogeneous, they all have the same length. Okay. So that's something you can, you can ask. And so let me go to a third problem, uh, which is a uh, old famous paper of Leon Papa Nicolau and Varadan about Hamilton Jacobi equation and homogenization of this. And this tells you that if you let UK to be the solution, so the solution in this case that means the viscosity solution of this Hamilton Jacobi equation with a certain initial condition, well, then it converges, it converges from the C0 topology to a function V, and V is the solution, the viscosity solution of this equation here, where H bar is called the effective Hamiltonian, and I should have assumed, to be more precise, that H is uh, coercive, for example, and uh, I think that's, well, that's all you have to, uh, that's all you have to assume. Uh, and then you would like to say, well, in what sense does this sequence of Hamiltonian, H of KX, P, converge to H bar. Okay. What, what kind of convergence do you have here? Uh, and you, I mean, what sort of puzzled me is that if you think of Hamilton-Jacobi equation, you have a method to solve them for a short time, which is the method of characteristics. So the method of characteristics just means that you're following the flow of the corresponding Hamiltonian system. So if you, what you would like to say is to say, well, if I'm following here, to solve this equation, the method of characteristics, in the end I should be able also to obtain this solution by solving the method of characteristic for h bar somehow, regardless of the smoothness of h bar, I should be able to, 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 solve the, to solve this. And so the flow, the Hamiltonian flow here, should converge somehow to the Hamiltonian flow here. Okay. But of course that's not the case. Well, first, why is the argument not correct? Well, the argument is not correct because as k increases the time uh, during which you can apply the method of characteristics gets shorter and shorter and so in the end you can apply the method of characteristics for time zero which of course doesn't give you anything. But somehow the situation is not as bad uh, so let me just uh, summarize the, what the problem, general problem is. You just take a Hamiltonian on the torus, so Tn times Rn with flow, I denote the flow by phi t of qp. Start with h smooth, as smooth, smooth as you wish. Uh, and then what happens when we look at h of k times q and p? So the flow I denote by phi kt. And then you just write down the equation, and you see that one of the equation has k in front, where k is going to go to infinity. So p dot is k times d over dq, and q dot is minus d over dq. So this, uh, this is actually d over dp. Uh, so this stays bounded somehow, but this is a singular perturbation problem. And another quite easy computation that you can do is the following: if rho k is just the k-fold covering of the torus, so you're just like wrapping one torus on the other k times. Well, then the flow phi kt is just up to conjugation the flow phi. So this the original flow during time kt up to this conjugation by this wrapping and unwrapping. So basically, the flow of this Hamiltonian here for time t, let's say for time 1, is like the flow of the original Hamiltonian during time k mod some conjugation by wrapping and unwrapping. Okay. So the conclusion is that you have a number of problems in uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, but they are all the same. So homogenization, which would be to go from H to HKQ here, 
similar perturbation, which is what you get when you write down the equation, and long time behavior, which is what happens here when you write phi kt to be the conjugate of phi k uh, of phi at time, at time kt. So these these are like usually three different problems in, 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 in usual dynamics. They don't have much to do. I mean, uh, well, I don't know what homogenization would be usual dynamics, but singular perturbation certainly uh, is a classical problem. Usually, doesn't have so much to do with uh, uh, with homogenization or even long time behavior. Uh, so let me state uh, the main result, which may be a little bit surprising the way it's stated. Uh, so this tells you the following: there's a projection operator. I mean, that's not so uh, so important. From C2, so C20 means that I'm looking at compact supported function. But at some point, one can get rid of the compact supported assumption and replace it by coercivity, but you, have, you need some assumption of behavior at infinity. So if you have a time dependent here Hamiltonian, you get here a Hamiltonian which is integrable, so the sequence, well, here actually I forgot about time. You can forget about, about time. So this sequence of Hamiltonian H of k times q and p c converges, and then we have to explain what this means somehow, to h bar p, where h bar p is time, uh, Hamiltonian, which is completely integrable, only depends on the p variables. And the same, if you look at the corresponding flows, phi kt, then this c converges to phi bar t, and phi bar t is the flow of h bar. And uh, well, I could wait until someone asks the questions, but h bar a priori is c0, so I, have, I will have to explain also what the flow of a c0 Hamiltonian is. Uh, actually, it's, I don't know if it's better or worse than that, but this map A actually extends by continuity to a map where instead of c2 you have just c0. So here I put c2 because at least you have real flow in this case. If the gradient is going to be c1, and so you can you have uh, the existence of the, of the flow. Uh, here, if I take, of course, C, H to be C0, I don't have existence of the flow, but this map extends by continuity. This map is also symplectically invariant, that's why it's called symplectic homogenization, in the sense that if you take any canonical change of variables or symplectic change of variable, then it doesn't, it doesn't change. And that's what somehow you should expect, because if you <coughs> let the group of symplectic map of this, of this Tn times Rn Act here on the variable on, on functions by change of variable here. There's no way you can make it act on only the variable p, except by the identity. So what it means is that if you replace here <coughs> the Hamiltonian by, by h composed with psi, <coughs> sorry, where well, psi is a symplectic map, then h bar remains the same. So that's why it means by symplectic invariance. And then you have a number of other properties which are stated here, which are well, more or less important, maybe the most useful one is, is, is this one. Uh, you have some monotonicity of this operation, which is also what explains the extension by by that. So, what I have to, I should explain is what, what this sentence, uh, phi bar t is the flow of h bar, means. Uh, what I should also tell you is what this C convergence means. I haven't, I haven't said that. Uh, what I should, another remark I can make is that, as in the first example I gave, what you can do is, is, you, is do the same uh, uh, homogenization, but only with respect to some of the variables. So if I have variables x and y and px and py, I can do homogenization just with respect to, let's say, to the variable x. And the way I get the homogenized Hamiltonian just by freezing the variables. So it just works in the, in the obvious way. Uh, so the map, this map can also extend to a map which gives you symplectic invariant. Maybe it's not so, uh, so interesting here. Uh, it gives you the same statement as in the beginning about hamilton jacobi uh, equation except that it gives you this, uh, Hamilton, uh, this convergence of solution from hamilton jacobi equation, not for viscosity solutions, but for what are called variational solutions, which are associated with this. 
So variational solution basically satisfies the same properties as viscosity solution in terms of continuity, except for one, which is the Markov property. So Markov property means start from a solution from an initial condition at time zero, go to time t, and then you take this as initial condition, follow the equation during time s, and doing that is exactly the same as if you started from the initial condition at time zero and got all the way to time t plus s without, without making a stopover at time t. Okay. And so this is the property, fundamental property of viscosity solution. It's not a property of variational solution, which can be uh, a disadvantage or an advantage, depending on how you look at it. But an advantage is that this tells you that you can have hysteresis phenomena. So hysteresis phenomenon is just the is just the property that it's not hard What happens depends on the history of your uh, of your solution. So depending on the situation, and this is also well, uh, I say that in this case this has the symplectic so three is the symplectic invariants that have been proved by Patrick Bernard, uh, except that this uh, function h bar appears in uh, these guys in uh, Aubrey Mather theory on dynamic resistance, where it's called alpha function. So if you're looking at the paper by Patrick Bernard, he will uh, prove the synthetic invariance of the, of the mother alpha function, but this is exactly the same thing as proving the synthetic invariance of h one. And uh, last thing is that many of the results, if you restrict yourself to strictly complex functions in P, strictly complex I'm talking in P, is actually a form of gamma form of gamma convergence, when I refer to the book by Bright's, of course, the gamma convergence is the Georgia, not Bright's, but uh, Bright's. Uh, that's uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so what are uh, the applications before I, I turn to, to some uh, explanation? Well, the first one, as I say, you, you can get homogenization for variation of solution of hamilton jacobi equation. You can get this for non-coercive Hamiltonians and, uh, as I say, synthetic invariance of the effective Hamiltonian equation. Uh, a second application, and this is also at the same time the explanation of what this convergence means, so if you have a sequence Hamilton of Hamiltonian HK that C converges to an Hamiltonian H bar, philosophically this means the following thing. Take any variational problem, reasonable. So you, you tell me a problem that variational problem, I will tell you whether it's reasonable or not. I guess I But apart from that, take any variational problem, apply it to so an example of variational problem is look at uh, for a metric look at the shortest geodesic in a homotopy class. That's a reasonable. The second shortest is also a reasonable variational problem. Uh, fixing endpoints, for example, is also a reasonable variational problem. So look at one of these problems, apply it to the Hamiltonian H. So in, my, in the case of the of the torus, apply it to a certain to a certain metric G sub K. So usually, I mean, you're, you're going to get a value, you're going to get a critical value. And my claim is that the sequence of critical value will converge to the critical value of the problem associated to H bar. And so there is something which is, there's an aspect which is not surprising and there's an aspect which is a little bit surprising that I would like to, uh, to stress. So the not surprising is that if you have a sequence of numbers, of weird numbers, that they, should, they will converge to something. That's <coughs> so if you have a sequence of problems uh, with critical values, I mean, it's, there are many cases where uh, the critical values corresponding to the sequence of problems will converge to something. That's, that's not something very unusual. Uh, what's a little bit more surprising here is that uh, this h bar that you get in the limit does not depend on the choice of your problem. So what you could imagine is that when you have a sequence hk, you have a problem, that's a variation of problem B, which gives you a number CK. And what you get is that this sequence CK converges to a number C, which is associated for, to a variation of problem, let's say the same variation of problem, for a Hamiltonian H, but which could depend on the problem. Yeah. A priori, that's what you could expect. 
And that's what does not happen here. Actually, the limiting, uh, the limiting H is always the same regardless of the problem you're using. And that's also uh, when you try to prove this uh, sort of crucial ingredient in the... And if, if you have no idea of, uh, of symplectic uh, geometry, I think the, the best way to understand this, uh, uh, this C convergence is just to, 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 say, to say it like this. You have HK converges to C0, uh, C converges to H bar if whatever rational problem you get the critical, the critical value, it will converge to the corresponding critical value for uh, H bar. So a number of other applications are uh, what's called aubrey mother theory in the non-convex case. So aubrey mother theory tells you that if you have, let's say, a Hamiltonian system, system on T star Tn, which is con convex and corrosive, then you get lots of invariant measures. And well, one way of getting these invariant measures is looking at orbits, minimizing orbits, and you make them longer and longer until you sort of escape to get a measure and see what happens to the limit. Now, it's not so clear how to do that in the non-convex case, and uh, in, in our situation, uh, it's exactly that's exactly the kind of result that that you get. Okay? That uh, you get many invariant uh, invariant measure even for. Uh, Hamiltonian system, which are which are not uh, which are not convex, have no convexity. And uh, another application is uh, existence of, of of periodic orbits. Uh, the reason why you get that is that for I mean is by usually using some penalization problem in the sense that if you have you look, you look at this sequence H K of uh, of Hamiltonian system, and for example in this case. Uh, where you look at uh, periodic orbits, so one periodic orbit of, of the system HK will correspond to k periodic orbits of the original system, up to some, something. And so uh, you know that as k is going to infinity, this will look more and more like solving the problem for H bar. And H bar is a completely integrable system, so this is going to be quite easy. And then you, you have to see that it actually corresponds to this approximation by, by HK. The idea is that a number of problems, so in this problem number three or number four, can actually be reduced in the end to a problem which involves only H bar. And then on H bar you can essentially compute everything explicitly. So you know, you know what happened. Uh, so there are two uh, uh, how am I about time? 10 minutes. So the <coughs> so this C convergence actually comes from a metric. So you, if you want to know a little bit more than this heuristic definition I just did, if it's based on the idea that if you have uh, let's say a partial differential equation or having some equation, there are many variations of problem that will solve the equation. But if you look at them topologically in, in the right way, they will all be equivalent. What I mean by this is that when, if you have a regular, if, if they are obtained by solving some, uh, uh, some critical, uh, yeah, let's say some critical value of a function, so you have this function, you look at the homology, for example, or the topology between two levels, and if you know it for one variation of problem, you will be able to know it from the other, for the other variation of problem up to some sort of obvious, obvious operation. Uh, again, I should have said all reasonable variation and formulation, and then again you could give me uh, the variation and formulation to tell you whether it's reasonable or not. But in general, this is the, this is the, the case. So, uh, well, let's forget maybe about this, uh, this first line here. Uh, there's a simple example is if, if you have a Lagrangian that's uh, some manifold which is the graph of the differential of a function, then you can define this number c of n as the oscillation of f. And from this you can, well, with, with quite a bit of work, I would say, you can define a metric on the set of uh, well, Lagrangian submanifolds, so which are the submanifolds on which the synthetic form vanishes here. And if L is the graph of the symplectic map, then you just take C of phi to be C of F. 
So you, you can basically forget about these few lines here. The important things are the properties, and the properties are the two properties here. So the first one is if you have C0 convergence of the flow, then you have convergence in, for the C topology. Well, that's not very surprising because then you just take, you could just say, let's take this uh, as, as C a topology which is equivalent to the C0 topology. What's more surprising, and uh, so this, this metric C, where well in this, uh, there was a similar metric which was defined by, by Hofer. This one is, is, uh, is slightly different uh, than the one defined by Hofer, but they basically have the same property. The second point, which is important one, is that if you have convergence of the Hamiltonian, then you have to see convergence. But if you think of the flow, what, it, what this means, when C convergence of the Hamiltonian to solve the Hamilton equation, you have to take the gradient. Already. And so the gradient, the C0 convergence of function will tell you nothing of the gradient. Not tell you any kind of convergence. So this is a quite surprising, quite surprising property and that's the crucial part. And so this tells you a number of things. Well, it tells you, you have this metric, and I haven't defined it, but I just tell you this exists. It has these properties here, and this property here implies that if you take the completion for this metric C of the set of all Hamiltonian, it will in particular contain all C0 Hamiltonian, because C0 convergence implies convergence for C. So the completion of one will contain the completion, will contain the C0 completion. So this explains why I have this Hamiltonian H bar, which a priori is only C0. And they say, well, I can look at the flow, but the flow only exists in the completion, so it's not a real map. It's not a diffeomorphism or anything, not even a homeomorphism. It's just an element in the completion. But of course, then what I, we do is that we all do in the uh, integration classes. If you, if you teach an integration class, at some point you define what is the L1 function. So you say, well, students should be very careful. It's not a function, L1 function. It's an equivalence class in an abstract space and so on. So you cannot identify these two functions. So that's lecture one. And usually lecture two, you take an M1 function and try to identify it as much as possible with an actual function. And here it's basically the same. I mean, the elements in the completion are just elements in the completion. But for example, uh, they could be, well, you can have a Hamiltonian which is smooth in one region, has a hypersurface on which it's not smooth, and then smooth on the other side of the region. Well, in that case, we try to identify an element in the completion to a flow which is the smooth flow on one side, another smooth flow on, on the other side, and then in the middle you have a sort of shear flow, something which, which doesn't match. Of course, that's a simple case. You could have awful things in the zero completion, but many examples end up, end up uh, like that. And so this is the sort of proper setting for this uh, symplectic homogenization. And uh, so the first step in, in the proof is to actually construct h bar. How do you find h bar? Well, the idea is that you're going to find some, if h bar is completely integral, but you can find the variational problem that gives you exactly h bar as a critical value. And then what you do is to say, well, I'm going to apply this variational problem to the hk, and it, at least it, it will give me, if I can prove convergence, it will be the, give me the candidate for h bar of k. And that's the first, the first step. Then what you have to prove is that hk actually converges so now you, you actually prove convergence for a very specific variational problem. And now you have to prove that given any variational problem, you will have also convergence. So I'm not going to prove that. Uh, what I'm going to, uh, to do, if I don't step on the cable here, is to explain how you prove that the second shortest, how you prove the second shortest genetic. How you put that from the second shortest geodesic, you have convergence. Is it, is it good enough here? Uh, can you see it? No. 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 Well, I probably can use. Can you see? 
better. Okay, so I have I have this metric which I which I sort of repeat here. And so in the middle here I have this sort of mountain this sort of mountain as, as before. And so on. And so assume I have the shortest I have the shortest geodesic which I will represent uh, let's see. So let's say the shortest geodesic is the one here. The one on the left hand side. But of course because this picture is, is periodic in all directions, it's also the same as it's also the same as the one I have here. And what I have to do is I have to take a find a family of, of curves here which go from the left side to the to the right side. And I'm going to look at the longest curve in the family and try to make this longest curve as short as possible. So there are two ways, the stupid way and the clever way. So what is the stupid way? Well, the stupid way is just to take this and translate it. So if you think in terms of having mountains here, you see that at some point you're going to cross all the mountains at the same time. So you're going to have a path which goes from here to here. And you, you, well, here you're crossing four, uh, four mountains of size 1 over 4, but in general you're going to cross k mountains of size 1 over k, and so you have no control on how long is the, is the, uh, is the longest curve in the family. And then you have the clever idea, I don't know who actually found that first, uh, I know that from a paper by Mangert, which consists in doing this. So you just pass obstacles one at a time. So the first thing you do, you're crossing here this, this first mountain. So it will cost you the longest curve in this family is going to have length basically 1 over k. And when you get here, well, you have to add something here and something here, but this is, this is a finite quantity. And then the next, the next step, you do this. Okay. Now this, this curve here, except for these two pieces, which have size 1 over k, we have the same length as this one because it's periodic. So this, this here and this here have the same length, and this here and this here both have the same length. So here I went up by one over k, but then I'm coming down again up to the fixed quantity. And now I'm doing the same here. So again I'm going up by basically one over k, but then I'm coming down again. And then in the end I'm going to be somewhere some, somewhere here. And this cost me 1 over k. So the, the length. So the length for lk. Uh, for the second, let's say, let's put the 2 for the second shortest one, is less than lk1. So the shortest one plus something of the order 1 over k. And so as you go to the limit, it's easy to see that this. Well, LK1 uh, converges to L infinity 1. And well, everything here is, is of course greater than LK1, which converges to L infinity 1. And so, of course, you have equality, which was the case for a completely integrable Hamilton. So, this idea of passing obstacles one at a time, of course, it's much more complicated if you do this for a general Hamiltonian where you have no convexity at all, like here, so it's not a minimization problem that you have to deal with, it's a min max problem, and uh, so that's the, the, the idea. Uh, well, before I conclude, I would like to thank Louis for, Louis for many things, and I must say that meeting you, Louis, was really a defining uh, period of my mathematical and personal, uh, personal life. And uh, I'm pretty sure that this is the case for many, many people here. So thank you for everything. And happy birthday.